So my name is Paul Whitaker. I'm a professor at uh, UW Stevens Point at Wausau. I used to be the UW Marathon County, like UW Fox Valley. Uh, we got joined with UW Stevens Point two years ago. Uh, and that's that's been interesting and fun to be part of a larger biology department. Uh, I've been presenting the entomology training and integrated pest management training for the Allegheny County Master Gardeners for quite some time. And, and they asked me to give this presentation, uh, given that we're in uh, COVID, Zoom, everything's virtual land. And, uh, and I quickly agreed because I enjoy giving these kinds of presentations. Um, I have my PowerPoint presentation available for you on a sharing website called dropbox.com. Um, and I, not everybody has PowerPoint, Microsoft PowerPoint. So I posted it both as a PowerPoint file and the PowerPoint as a PDF file. So if you don't have PowerPoint, you can still get access to it. I've got some live internet links, some live URLs in the PowerPoint presentation, and those are also in the PDF file. So, um, so either format should work for you. Uh, and I have these links posted in the chat. So you can just copy and paste those links. You don't even know, need to go into dropbox.com. You can just type copy these tiny URL uh, and paste those into your browser and you can get access to those presentations. And they'll be there um, in perpetuity. So, uh, so if, if, if you wanna download them now to take notes or, um, or if you wanna review later and, and this presentation is being recorded so you can come back and take a look at those as well. So, uh, so we've got an hour and uh, there's no way that I can cover all of organic insect pest management in uh, in an hour, and I want to leave time for any specific questions that you have at the end. So the outline that I'm going to talk about is, um, if we were talking about chemical pest management, it would be uh, identify your pest, go find a pesticide that is registered for that pest, and then follow the label directions, spray it, problem solved. And, uh, if With chemical pest management, it's pretty straightforward. You find a chemical, you spray it, problem solved. With organic insect pest management, there are some reasons that people want to try to avoid chemical um, insecticides or herbicides or fungicides. And the trade-off is uh, you avoid the chemical exposure to yourself and, and, and your land and, and non-target organisms, but it comes at a trade-off of requiring more knowledge. Organic insect pest management is a more knowledge intensive means of controlling insects. So, uh, and, and many of, although there are sprayable organic products that will kill insects, uh, they typically don't last as long as chemical sprays. They don't kill as many kinds of insects at as many different life stages as chemical insecticides. So we really need to use a multifaceted uh, control approach to deal with insects organically. And that, that process starts with prevention. So anything that you can do to prevent an insect problem from happening is going to be helpful. Uh, if prevention fails, then there are some, some trapping and hand picking techniques that will kill insects without having to spray something. And if that fails, then it's time to, to resort to one of the organic spray products. And uh, so I'm going to walk through that. But given the idea that there's no way I can cover everything in the time that we have this morning, I also have a long list of resources at the end of the presentation that will um, get you going in the right direction and give you the more specific details that you need to control whatever pest you have organically. Um, but please, as I go through this, if you have questions, make a note of them. Uh, Tom, you can, you can email those to Tom um, and, and, uh, or you can hang on to them and, and we'll have some time for a Q&A at the end of this presentation as well. So starting with prevention, um, one of the first things that organic farmers, organic gardeners know is that healthy plants tend to be less attractive to insect pests and more resistant to attack by insect pests. They're more able to defend themselves. And I think one of the best examples of that, if you've paid any attention to all of the wildfires that are going on out in the, in the Western United States and Rocky Mountains and things, uh, Part of the problem is an extended drought that has uh, eliminated or greatly reduced the ability of those coniferous forest trees to defend themselves against the attack of a bark beetle. A healthy, well-watered conifer 
uh, has the ability to produce resin or pitch that floods out those insects, traps them in sticky goo, and the tree withstands the attack just fine. With years of extended drought, those trees are stressed and the insects have had their way with the trees in huge swaths, many, many square miles of forest, hundreds, thousands of square miles of forest have been killed. And then the drought just makes those tinder for wildfires. So, so the idea of organic gardening and prevention is, is to have the right plant in the right place so that the plant is not stressed and then take care of that plant using appropriate irrigation, not too much, not too little, making sure that the plant is not nutrient starved for anything. So soil testing is important, application of appropriate fertility and compost, uh, that light is appropriate, humidity and that kind of thing. So keeping the plant healthy is going to help reduce insect problems off the bat. Um, if it's appropriate, so certainly not in a perennial flower garden, but in a vegetable garden or uh, an annual flower garden, uh, there are certain insects that attack crops that will spend the winter in the soil right under those plants, or they might spend the winter in the debris of the previous year's plants. And so if that material is still there the next spring, those insects will come out. And if you put the same plant or the same family of plants in the same location, those insects will get started on their destructive season immediately right away without having to disperse and try to find, find plants. So destroying infested crop residues, doing crop rotation if it's appropriate, also will help prevent insect problems. Um, there are lots and lots of beneficial insects and other things called natural enemies, uh, predatory mites and predatory spiders, parasitic wasps and flies, lady beetles, lacewings, all kinds of things that will help control insects. And I, I call this kind of behind the scenes insect control. And so uh, anything that you can do that will create environmental conditions that the pests don't like if it's possible to know that and create those conditions uh, and that are favorable to beneficial insects and the other natural enemies, that will be helpful. And the picture that you see here needs a little explanation. This is a picture that I took at probably the largest organic vegetable farm in Wisconsin. It's uh, Harmony Valley Farm down in Viroqua, Wisconsin in the southwest part of the state. And this is a, a very experienced, very knowledgeable organic farmer. I had the privilege of meeting him and doing some small research projects on his farm when I was a graduate student about 25 years ago at UW-Madison. And these are young pepper plants that he's transplanted out into, a, into the field. And you can see the rows between the beds are mulched with straw. And that does a couple of things. It conserves moisture in the soil. It eliminates the need to do weeding or greatly reduces the need to do weeding but also a lot of beneficial insects and spiders find that shelter, that shade, that high humidity, a really favorable place to spend the hot sunny days. And then at night, they will come out and look for food and those crop plants are right next to the, that straw mulch. So he's provided some habitat for those beneficials right next to the crop. The mulch, the plastic mulch that you see on the beds is really interesting and I've not seen this anywhere else. But plastic mulch is often used to conserve moisture in soil and to eliminate the need for weeding. You just punch holes in the plastic and you plug, plug the plants in. Obviously, you need to have drip irrigation underneath that to provide water to the plants. But what's interesting about this particular mulch is that silvery metallic strip down the middle and along the edges. So the black strips help warm the soil because peppers like warm soil. But peppers can succumb to diseases uh, by flying insects that take a little taste of them in much the same way that we might come down with West Nile virus or Zika virus or um, malaria, yellow fever by the bite of a mosquito. There are lots of insects that are sap feeding insects and they'll land on a plant and take a taste. And if it's the right kind of plant, they'll settle down and feed. And if it's not, they'll fly on and, and taste other plants to find one. But in that tasting or in that feeding, they can infect the plant with viruses. And the viruses, there's no cure for that once the plant is infected. So what the silvery strip does is it reflects the sky 
And the insects, uh, their vision is not the best. They see a very pixelated view of the world. And that silvery reflection coming from the ground kind of confuses them because normally light comes from the sky and light coming from the ground confuses them and it makes them sort of just completely avoid those plants. So there's a lot going on in this little simple picture that you see here. A green plant against dark soil stands out really well to a plant. Uh, some farmers have even found that straw mulch over potato plants um, or, you know, on and around potato plants is a light background rather than a dark soil background. And that can really reduce insect problems on potato plants, just the straw mulch alone. No, hang on a second. I'm alone at home with a three-year-old. You may not interrupt me. You just have to watch your show. I need to tell you something. Quickly. A long, long time ago, I had a bone my side. All right. Sorry about that, three-year-olds. Um, so uh, the bottom bullet point here, too, is that if it's possible to use an uh, insect-resistant variety of a crop, if, if such a thing is available, and sometimes there are, uh, that also will help reduce pest problems and the need to do anything else. Uh, that information is kind of hard to find for insects, so you might check seed catalogs, seed packets, um, extension publications. And I do something in my own vegetable garden, which is I always grow multiple varieties of the same crop side by side, and I have found huge differences sometimes in different varieties of the same crop where the insect pests will definitely have a strong preference for one of those varieties. And if, if the damage is enough, I just won't grow that variety anymore and I'll stick with the ones that are more resistant. So, uh, so prevention is, is a great starting point. I love this picture. This shows the value of resistant crop varieties. Uh, wheat is um, commonly attacked by a little midge called a hessian fly, picture of the adult fly down on the bottom left. And they tend to lay their eggs down in that tight cluster of where all the leaves and the stems join together. And the little fly maggots will feed on that and really weaken the plants and kill off many of them. And uh, plant breeders have done a lot of breeding of wheat simply to be resistant, not genetically engineered. This is just typical plant breeding. Uh, and you can see the difference in the health of these young wheat seedlings between the two varieties. Same soil, same location, same habitat. It's just the genetics of the plants are different and uh, the one variety is much more resistant. So uh, clearly the right side is not going to have a very good yield of wheat uh, or they might have, if that's the variety that they had to grow, they may have had to use uh, extensive applications of insecticides across that huge acreage where the resistant variety completely eliminates the damage and the need for a treatment. Uh, I mentioned natural enemies, and this is one of my favorite topics, beneficial insects and beneficial predators and parasites of insects. Uh, there are all kinds of, of them, and often their activity is kind of invisible. Uh, you know, if you were to go out to, um, never had the privilege of doing this, but like an African savanna, you might get all excited if you saw a lion. Uh, or a cheetah or one of the big predators. But mostly what you see are the plant feeding animals. You see gazelles and wildebeests and giraffes and zebras, uh, and they're all out there feeding on the plants. Imagine the plants being your crops and all of those huge magnificent herbivores being the pests. You rarely see an act of predation, right? It's rare to actually observe a lion or a cheetah taking down one of those pests. Uh, and you don't see the tapeworms and the other parasites that are inside of those herbivores, maybe weakening, weakening them and eventually perhaps killing them in some cases. That's all sort of behind the scenes. And that's the way the activity of many of these beneficial insects are, especially the, the parasites. So uh, this little tiny insect on the top left is called a minute pirate bug. It's less than an eighth of an inch long and it's feeding on hundreds of aphids a day and killing them. Uh, lady beetles are pretty recognizable, but you might not recognize their larvae just to the right of the adult. Uh, there are diseases 
that will attack insects, bacteria and fungi and viruses. And some of these are commercially available. Some of them are just out in the environment doing their thing, kind of invisible. You see a sick insect, a sluggish insect, you don't know what's going on. Uh, below the lady beetle larva here, this is a little tiny, tiny wasp, probably less than a 16th of an inch long. And it's on the chrysalis of one of the cabbage white butterflies that lays their eggs and turns into the velvety green caterpillars that feed on cabbage and broccoli and all of that kind of thing. What this little female has done is she's scoped out the size of this pupa of the butterfly and figured out just how many eggs she can lay inside of it. And she punctures the body wall of that chrysalis and lays uh, many dozen eggs that will hatch and eat out the guts of that caterpillar or that butterfly pupa. And this is that same pupa several days later. And the white little things in there that look like maggots are wasp larvae. They're the immature stages of this little parasite. So you're not gonna see her laying eggs probably. You'll see these chrysalids on your plants maybe. And you're not gonna know when you look at that chrysalis unless you open it up that there are parasites inside and that that butterfly will never come out and lay eggs and create more caterpillars that will feed on your plants again. Uh, similar situation on the right hand side here. This is a parasitic fly. Looks like a house fly, but it's in a different family of flies. And these are its eggs that it's laid sort of behind the head on a forest tent caterpillar. And then those fly eggs will hatch. The maggots will burrow into the guts of the caterpillar and eat out the guts and then kill it and come out as a mature maggot that will turn into a pupa and come out as a fly. Again, you're not gonna see that happening very often unless you specifically go looking for it. So this biological control is really important and it's um, something that, that we can take advantage of or that we can facilitate and enhance in our landscapes. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, another form of prevention is just a physical barrier. And one of my favorite low-tech technologies in my own large vegetable garden in my backyard is a material called floating row cover. It's uh, sometimes called garden fabric, but that can get you into trouble because garden fabric uh, sometimes refers to weed barrier fabric. This uh, floating row cover is called floating because it's thin and wispy. It looks white here, but more than enough light gets through this to allow plants to grow underneath it. Rain will go right through it, but it helps protect the plants from wind. It excludes insects from getting to them. Uh, and it can give you a couple of degrees of frost protection in the spring and in the fall as well. Uh, I'll sometimes even use this in July, not to control insects or prevent insects, but if I want to plant a fall crop of, of carrots, for example, little tiny seeds that might take two weeks to germinate, and if they dry out at all, once you've planted them, the plants won't grow. The floating row cover keeps the shade, uh, shades the soil a little bit, keeps the wind off, keeps the humidity up, and you get much, much better germination of, of those carrot seeds in the summertime. So, so it's a magical product um, and it simply keeps in insects away from your plants as long as you've got the edges tucked down or weighted down well. Uh, the plants will grow, they'll germinate, they'll push up against it. And then eventually if you've got a fruiting crop like melons or cucumbers or zucchinis or something, you'll need to take that fabric off so that the pollinators can get to it. But by that time, usually the plants are big enough that insect problems won't be significant. So floating row cover, you can find that at any good garden center or some of the big box stores as well. So good prevention material. Obviously, probably you don't wanna use this against Japanese beetles in your flower garden because the whole point of flowers is to see them, but for vegetable gardens uh, or even starting, starting turf grass seed, lawn seed, uh, this is great stuff. So if prevention fails, uh, what can we do that doesn't involve spraying? Well, Gardeners and farmers have been creative. There are lots of ways of trapping insects. Uh, and in some cases, the traps will kill the insect. Uh, in some cases, you have to go to the trap and, and extract the insects and kill them 
on your own, but you're not putting anything potentially toxic into the environment and, and you're probably having minimal effect on pollinators and, and other insects. Uh, so I'll show you a couple of pictures of some of these traps on the next slide or two. You can also hand pick, which gets non-entomologists a little widgety, like you mean I actually have to touch the insect, which kind of grosses some people out. Uh, I think it's kind of fun. It can be tedious if you've got, you know, 30 feet of potatoes growing and they're infested with Colorado potato beetles and you have to go find them all and hand pick them. Uh, one of the things that you can do is knock them into soapy water. And people will do this for Japanese beetles and for potato beetles. Um, the trick is to actually get them into the soapy water. So a dishpan or a bucket. And the reason for a little bit of soap is just to break the surface tension. So when the insect hits the water, they won't float on the top and be able to crawl out of the bucket, but they'll actually sink to the bottom and drown. So I'll show you a picture of that. And then there are some baits. And baits might be something that attracts the organism, attracts the pest and kills it directly. So you might have heard of the idea of setting out little bowls of beer for slugs. The slugs are attracted to the fermenting aroma of the yeast. And they come in to take a sip and they're supposed to like fall in and drown in beer. Uh, every college student's dream, right? Uh, there are other baits that don't involve bowls of beer. There's a commercial product called Sluggo that works against slugs. It's a, it's a meal product with either a chemical agent called metaldehyde or an organic product called iron phosphate that the slugs ingest that meal product and the toxin and it kills them. Uh, Sluggo Plus has added an organic insecticide to it. So it will work for the little roly polies and particularly for earwigs that like some of the same habitats as slugs. Uh, if you've had an ant infestation in your house or outdoors, uh, you may have heard of the trick of honey with a little small amount of borax, 20 mule team borax mixed in. And it's a bait that the worker ants will pick up that sweet honey, not really recognizing that there's borax in it. And they'll take it back and feed it to the queen and feed it to their larvae. And over time, it will eventually kill the colony. So that's an effective strategy. Um, so these are some examples of, of traps and hand removal. Um, the jug that you see on the top left is a trap for coddling moths, which is the uh, stereotypical worm in the middle of an apple. And inside that jug is a variety of things. It could be a little bit of molasses and a little bit of vinegar with water. Uh, it could be some bananas or banana peels and a little brown sugar. You can find lots of recipes for things to put in there. But the adult moths are looking for something sort of fermenting and syrupy and sweet. And they fly into that cutout milk jug to get a sip and they, they land in that material and they, that's their last meal. Uh, in the middle, you can see a commercial purchased red sphere that's coated with a material called Tanglefoot or Tangle Trap. And that sphere is probably about three to four inches in diameter. It looks like, to a fly's eyes, a great big ripe apple and a perfect place to lay your eggs. So this is a trap that can be used either for trapping out apple maggots, which are the little railroad worms that get into apples, uh, or just for monitoring when they're flying so that you know when to do a, a different type of treatment. It can be used either way. Top right picture is, if you look carefully, these are some uh, raspberries and there's Japanese beetles there and a pan of soapy water and just kind of coming up and tapping that branch so that the beetles drop off and land in the soapy water. And you can, you can eliminate quite a few Japanese beetles or potato beetles pretty quickly that way. Bottom left is a burlap trap for gypsy moths. And gypsy moths feed uh, up in the leaves of lots of different forest and landscape trees at nighttime. And they feed at night so that they don't get preyed upon by birds. And then during the daytime, they travel down the trunk and nestle down at the bottom of the trunk in the grass and the weeds and under bark scales and things. So they make a daily pilgrimage up and down the tree trunks and a, a band of burlap like this, they will find a suitable place to spend the daytime. 
They'll crawl it in between those multiple layers of the burlap or between the burlap and the trunk. And you can go out every day at some point during the daylight hours and shake out that burlap into a pan of soapy water and, and control the gypsy moths very readily that way. The nice thing about gypsy moth is there's just one generation a year and the caterpillars will pretty much feed on the tree where their mom laid the eggs. So it won't take very many days of this to eliminate the gypsy moth larvae on, uh, on a particular tree. And then the bottom right is uh, rolled up newspaper. And I learned this trick actually from some Mexican women that I, I spent a couple of years before graduate school volunteering in Mexico, where I ran a family gardens project with low income women in the shanty towns of border cities in Mexico. And uh, in that very arid landscape of the Southwest, uh, a moist garden that was, was watered, the earwigs found it to be a really favorable place and there was not a lot for them to eat. So they would eat seedlings and get into lettuce and cabbages and other kinds of things. Uh, and like the gypsy moth, they typically will come out and do their feeding and prowling around at night to avoid predators. And then they look for a tight, moist, sheltered, hidden place to spend the daytime. And so a rolled up chunk of newspaper like this, particularly if you've moistened it well or soaked it with water, the earwigs find that an irresistible sort of B and B a way uh, to hide away the daytime hours. And you can go out every, every day at some point during the daylight hours, the time is not particular. Uh, and you can unroll that newspaper over a bucket of soapy water and all of the earwigs will drown in the soapy water. You put it back out. And uh, because we only have one generation of earwigs per year, you can trap out the earwigs in a limited area fairly quickly and not have to continue with that all year long. So each of these traps is specific. It depends a bit on the biology of the insect, where they, where they move, what they feed on, what they're attracted to. But there are lots and lots of trapping ideas. Uh, a bad trap idea, was a good idea, uh, is the bag of bug for Japanese beetles. And imagine how satisfied you would be if Japanese beetles are plaguing your landscape. You go out and you find a trap that looks like this one, uh, full of beetles, like, oh my gosh, I've killed gazillions of Japanese beetles. And you can see how full that trap is at the bottom. These are traps that have a pheromone, which is a chemical attractant for the beetles, and a floral scent. And the beetles find it irresistible and they fly in and they hit those yellow panels at the top and they drop down into the bag at the bottom. But what research has shown is that the vast majority of the beetles actually don't wind up in the trap. And so these traps actually increase the Japanese beetle population in the area around the trap. So the joke amongst entomologists is these traps are great, buy one and then give it to your neighbors. Don't put it on your own property. And so that your neighbor will attract your Japanese beetles and all of the other neighborhood Japanese beetles to their land, uh, but don't, don't put it on your own property. Um, Sluggo, this is the Sluggo Plus product. Uh, and this, I zoomed up this label here, the OMRI is something that's very important to certified organic farmers who have to comply with USDA organic regulations. The OMRI stands for the Organic Materials Review Institute. And anything that farmers, organic farmers use has to be OMRI approved. And so if you see that OMRI label on a pesticide, you know that it is truly organic. Um, and I put in here the, uh, I zoomed in on the active ingredients. This is something that you should look at on pesticide labels, whether they be chemical or organic, and find out what is the active ingredient. Uh, in this case, the iron phosphate, that's basically fertilizer. It's a form of iron and a form of phosphorus that plants can use, but it's toxic to slugs. Not toxic to people, not toxic to animals, um, and it's mixed with inert ingredients, other ingredients, 98% of this material 99% almost is other ingredients. That's gonna be the food and some other things. Uh, and then the spinosad is the organic insecticide. So this is the spinosad plus that will kill slugs and earwigs and pill bugs and um, cutworms and other things that we attracted to feed on it. Uh, this slug video is really 
interesting. It's kind of fun. It's only 90 seconds long, but this is a test of the beer trap for slugs. Uh, I think it covers a whole night in about 90 seconds. Um, and the slugs love the beer that you can see them like coming in from feet away because they can smell the beer, they drink it and they leave. So it's not just a pan of beer that is attractive to slugs, but you have to orient it in the appropriate way that the slugs will actually fall in. And one of the recommendations is not just use a pie pan like this, because you can see these slugs are not likely to die uh, from drowning in beer. But instead, if you use a canning jar and bury the canning jar so that its rim is level with the soil, because it sort of cuts under, the slugs have to really reach in and they lose a grip and they're more likely to drown. So. Uh, so there are techniques, even some of these simple techniques, there's knowledge involved in using them effectively. Okay, so I alluded to this at the beginning of my presentation, the idea that uh, organic controls are knowledge intensive, uh, whereas chemical controls have some real assets going for them. And you can kind of read through this table probably faster than I can talk about it. But Comparing chemical insecticides to organic controls, um, chemical controls are usually broad spectrum, so they'll kill a lot of things, whereas organic controls tend to be more specific. Chemical insecticides typically act fast. Organic controls are often slower. Uh, the effect of the environment on how well these things work usually is minimal for chemical insecticides because they are they are toxic and uh, the environment doesn't really matter. Environmental conditions like humidity and sunlight and temperature and timing and rain often are much more, uh, have much greater impact on organic controls. Many chemical insecticides have a longer period of activity after you apply them. They don't break down very fast. The opposite is true for organic materials. And so as a result, you often have to uh, apply an organic control much more frequently than with chemical insecticides. Uh, you often need to combine organic controls with multiple techniques like prevention, uh, trapping, hand picking, uh, or other kinds of things, whereas a chemical insecticide, usually spray it and you're done. Um, often, depending on the material, and this I guess refers primarily to the sprayed materials, organic sprays tend to be more expensive they're more specialized, there's supply and demand, right? There's less demand for them compared to chemical insecticides. Uh, and sometimes they're hard to find, right? Whereas chemical insecticide, you can go to Fleet Farm, Menards, Home Depot, a garden center, Walmart, you can find them just about anywhere. Uh, the organic controls, you have to shop around a little more and sometimes even mail order them. Uh, so, so with all of that, you might say, gosh, you'd have to be an idiot to do organic controls, right? It's, they're, they're slow, they're expensive, they're hard to find, they don't last, you have to apply them more often. Chemical controls are the panacea. Uh, but obviously people are interested in organic controls because chemical products persist in the environment longer, which means they potentially could contaminate soil or groundwater or surface water or have uh, greater effects on things that you don't want to kill, like pollinators or amphibians or reptiles or birds or other things. Um, and the risk to the applicator or the consumer, the person that lives around or eats that product, the risk is generally higher with chemical pesticides. So, so this sort of captures why people might be interested in using organic controls, right? So they persist in the environment for a shorter time, which is bad in the sense you have to apply them more often, good in the sense that their uh, adverse effects are likely to be less uh, on non-targets, pollinators, beneficial insects, birds, people, and so on. So, so regardless of what you spray, whether it be an organic material or a chemical material, it's absolutely essential that you read and follow the label. Um, some of the things, the labels can be really long, and, and I kind of equate some of it to like the instructions for a toaster, right? If, if I were to write instructions for a toaster, take it out of the box, plug it in, put your toast in the slot, push the lever down and make sure that the darkness control is where you want it to be, right? But if you look at the directions for a toaster, it has all kinds of things like 
Don't put your fingers in the hole and don't use it in the bathroom. Don't take it into the bathtub with you. Don't use it outside at a picnic in the rain. Be careful, it's gonna be hot. So there's a lot of sort of like common sense stuff that they have to put in there. Pesticide labels are kind of the same way. They're really long. There's some jargon. There's some stuff that the pesticide manufacturers are requ required to put in there. But the key things to look for when you look at a pesticide label are what pests is this material labeled for? And there will always be a statement on that label. It is actually a violation of federal law to use any insecticide, whether it be chemical or organic, in ways that are not in accordance with the label. Uh, for organic controls, the target pests are important because the product simply might not work against other insects. Uh, application rates are important. People sometimes think, well, three is good, four might be a little bit better. Sometimes four might actually damage the plants or four might have a repellent effect on the insects and not actually kill them. So the application rates are important. Uh, safety precautions and personal protective equipment, the PPE, that's important. Uh, organic sprays are safer than chemical in general, but not necessarily safe, period. Like you wouldn't want to go out and spray them in shorts and bare feet and get the residue on your legs in some cases. Uh, Re-entry restrictions, so how long after you've treated an area until it is considered safe enough to go back in. Most organic materials, it's once the material has dried. With some chemical materials, it might be a couple of days until it's considered safe enough to go back in. And then for food crops, the pre-harvest interval is important. And this can vary even for the same insecticide for different plants. Uh, so I wanna show you a label for seven, which is a very commonly available chemical insecticide. Uh, and so let me zoom in on this a little bit so we can see the label. So this is actually the farmer label for this material. 43% um, is the active ingredient. Uh, first aid is first. Long list of personal protective equipment that's required. User safety precautions, the equipment that you need. Um, Environmental hazards are listed here. Here's that statement. It's a violation of federal law to use any insecticide in violation of the label. Um, Pre-harvest intervals are listed here. Application procedures, mixing and loading. Um, any insecticide can lead to resistance evolving in the pest. So if you use the same material too often in a row. Um, but down here are some uses. So for ornamental trees and plants, there's a whole long list. Remember I said chemical insecticides tend to be broad spectrum. So we're seeing beetles, aphids, caterpillars, psyllids, which are bark lice, cutworms, which are caterpillars, uh, leaf miners, which might be flies. So lots of different kinds of insects, sow bugs, which are actually not even insects, uh, ticks, not insects, but they're controlled by this. Um, restrictions, how often you can apply it. Re-entry interval of 12 hours. Um, brassica leafy vegetables. Do not apply within three days of harvest for some, 14 days of harvest of other ones, right? So you really need to read the label and know what you're doing. So, so that's just an example of a pesticide label for a chemical insecticide. Um, so a couple of organic products I wanted to talk about. Bt is one of the most common ones. This has been used by organic farmers since probably the late 1940s. Uh, it was discovered that a soil bacterium produced a protein that basically uh, takes effect in the alkaline gut the high pH gut of caterpillars, they eat it, they stop feeding within a few hours, and then they die within a couple of days. So um, this is one of the products, Caterpillar Killer. You wouldn't see that this is Bt unless you looked down here on the label at the active ingredients and it will say Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt. Um, this is the back, kind of a cartoon of the bacterium and there's a healthy cabbage looper 
one that is paralyzed and stopped feeding, and then there's one that has been killed by Bt. So it works in a couple of days, not in a couple of minutes. Show you the label for this one. Oh, what? This link worked yesterday. Uh, let me see. Oh, dang. I tested that link just yesterday. Drat. Let me try this. Problem with the internet, things change from one day to the next. Uh, there, that's the one. Okay, so this is the Thuricide. This is one brand name of a BT product. And you can see instead of 16 pages, it's only four. The cautions and environmental hazards are much shorter. The protective gear is basically just cover your skin. Uh, and then agricultural use, re-entry interval of four hours, not 12. And then the pests, much fewer, and they are all just caterpillars. So the BT is much more specific. What that means is it's not gonna kill spiders or ladybugs or bumblebees or honeybees or parasitic wasps or any of those kinds of things. It's a very specific product uh, and it's limited to caterpillars only. And that's it, that's the whole label, right? So you get a sense that it's more limited in its usefulness, more limited in its non-target effects and, uh, but much safer to use. Uh, BT is most effective against small caterpillars, breaks down fairly quickly in sunlight and heat. Uh, there are materials that you can buy where you buy chemical insecticides or organic ins insecticides called sticker spreaders. Uh, and these are materials that you add to a sprayed material to help it stick to the plant surfaces. And this is important because this is a, a material that the caterpillars need to eat. So you want it to actually stick on the leaves and not run off. So, um, but there are some brand names here, Dipel, Thurside, Green Step, the safer caterpillar killer that I showed you. Um, but the active ingredients will say what it is. Uh, there are some other strains of this bacterium that produce different toxins, different proteins that are available for fungus gnats, usually a problem in house plants and greenhouses, not outside. Uh, for mosquito larvae, so if you have a koi pond or a rain barrel or something or a pond, and for a adult Japanese beetles. Uh, this is the caterpillar version of BT, and this is a graph from one of the sources that I'll show you in a little bit. And uh, what the, the vertical axis is, the number of recent research studies that showed different levels of control. 75% uh, or better control, 50% or better for fair, and less than 50% for poor. And so stink bugs are not caterpillars, so poor control of them. Um, caterpillars, diamondback moth, cabbage looper, all of these worms, fair to good control of those. But what's interesting to me is the ones that I've identified with a star here, European corn borer and corn earworm, both are caterpillars that should succumb to BT, but they're not. They're not dying. And why might that be? Because the corn earworm is feeding inside the, the husk, feeding on the kernels of the corn. So you have to spray it right when those eggs are, are laid on the silk. So the caterpillar, the first couple of bites that it takes before it gets into the ear of corn is killed. Once they're in, they're in, and it's not going to have any effect. European corn borer feeds inside the stems of corn. The eggs are laid on the surface, so you got to get that material onto the plant when the, at the time when the eggs are laid. So again, that knowledge-intensive aspect. Uh, you can buy mosquito dunks for mosquitoes. These are basically just floating pellets of something that contains the appropriate BT strain uh, and something that the mosquito larvae like to eat. They eat it, they get paralyzed, they die. Um, there are not, there, there are non-organic, non-biological mosquito dunks as well. 
So uh, if you're gonna buy mosquito dunks and you're interested in organic, you wanna make sure you get one that has Bt as the active ingredient. Uh, natural, clever name, right? This is the Bt product for fungus gnats. And this is a product that I have not used yet. Uh, it's only been on the market for a couple of years. It's very expensive, but it's a new BT product that is effective against adult Japanese beetles. And that's pretty unusual. Uh, if it works well, uh, it will be a godsend for people that suffer from Japanese beetle infestations, but don't want to use organic insecticides or, or chemical insecticides rather. Uh, spinosin, the second product I wanted to talk about, this is a product of a soil microorganism. Uh, it's a neurotoxin, like most chemical insecticides are, which means that it works against a broader spectrum of pests. It also will kill bees and parasitic, or parasitic flies and wasps and things while it's wet, not so much once the residue dries. So you may want to apply it in the evening, once the pollinators and things have gone back into their hives or nests, uh, and so that you're not having a non-target effect. So this is probably, this and BT are probably the two most widely used organic insecticide materials. And again, you're not gonna see spinosin or spinosin in the name of the product. That's the active ingredient down here. So these are brand names for that product. Uh, spinosin effect, efficacy, a uh, wide variety of insects uh, and much higher number of studies. So looking at caterpillars, like 33 recent studies showed good control against caterpillars. Uh, it looks like 12 studies showed good and a couple showed fair control of Colorado potato beetle and other beetles. So, um, so it's a pretty effective wide spectrum product. And then this is uh, spinosid against a whole variety of other insect pests. Uh, and these graphs, I'm buzzing by them pretty fast, but I'll, I'll talk about them just a little bit more in a minute with our resources. There are lots of other plant-based controls that are organically acceptable and um, available. Hot pepper wax, garlic barrier, citrus oil is repellent to a lot of insects. Uh, there are a whole variety of products based on neem, which is a tropical tree, uh, pyrethrum, which is an African daisy, Rotenone, which is a tropical vine or shrub that the roots are toxic. Um, but this book, I can't recommend highly enough if you're interested in organic control. Um, and this would be true for insect and diseases. It emphasizes vegetable crops, but uh, I'll show you a little bit more about this. So those graphs that I was showing you are from this book and it's available as a free online resource. Uh, so putting it all together, um, I won't go through this because we're running a little bit short on time, but apples are a really difficult crop to grow organically because there are many different diseases and a whole variety of different insects that will attack the fruit and the foliage year round. And I'll just buzz through this. This is from uh, Michael Phillips, is an organic apple grower in New Hampshire that wrote a book called The Apple Grower. And these are all things that are recommended as sort of the ideal organic management for apples to be grown organically. And it's for insect control, for cultural, for fertility management, uh, for disease management. But when the buds are pink, when the petals drop throughout the summer, after harvest, once the apples are picked, you're not done yet. You're doing some prevention work for next year. So that's a long sequence of stuff. So in terms of resources, I'll finish up with this and then we'll take some questions. The resource guide for insect, organic insect and disease management is from Cornell University. Uh, I forget how long it is, like 150 pages. The whole thing is available as a free PDF online at this website. Uh, if you like it, it's $20 for a hard copy and that's well worth it as a great resource. This is kind of how the table of contents is listed. So these are vegetable crops and it will talk you through uh, and show pictures of the common insect and disease problems that each of these crops succumbs to and recommended management. There's a whole section on organic spray materials, uh, some of which we've talked about, um, the pyrethrum and neem, the uh, spinosad is in there, BT is in there, and then, 
habitat for beneficial insects I talked about a little bit, trap cropping and insect control, a uh, whole variety of things. So it's a fantastic resource. This is a University of Wisconsin Extension publication that I was the lead author on revising in, um, I think about 2008, called Biological Control of Insects and Mites. It's about 100 pages, again, a free PDF online from the Learning Store website uh, at UW-Madison or $12 for a hard copy. Uh, great introduction to basic insect biology. Um, and then the focus is primarily on biological control. So using beneficial insects and predators and parasites and diseases to control insect pests. Uh, a couple of other books, IPM for gardeners is integrated pest management, ecology for gardeners, sort of building that knowledge base of how ecosystems in your gardens function. ATRA is a, a part of the USDA. It's the National uh, Center for Appropriate Technology. And this is a website that uh, has a lot of great information for sustainable gardening and organic farming. Um, so in their topics list, horticultural crops, this is gonna be things like fruit crops, herbs, vegetables, flowers. And so you can zoom in on that and they'll have a whole guide, for example, on organic tomato production, or organic apple production, or organic herbs, whatnot. Uh, there's a whole section on organic pest management. back. Why are we going back? There we go. Um, so pest management, there's a whole list of resources there. Um, soils and composting. So, so ATRA is a terrific resource to know about and spend some time poking around on their website. Uh, they have one of their things under pest management is a bio rationals database. And basically what this means is uh, biologically based sprays like BT and spinosad and some microbial things um, and lots of great information there as well. So you'll have to do a little poking around to figure out how that one works. Uh, if you're interested in organic lawn care, this is one from the National Organic Farmers Association or Northeast Organic Farming Association on organic lawns and gardens. This is like a 70 page PDF that's available for free. Ohio State put together a terrific, very detailed fact sheet on organic lawn, turf grass management. So that's a great one. And that's my presentation. So uh, we're almost at an hour, but I am happy to stick around and answer whatever questions you have. Okay, looking at the uh, chats here, um... Let's see. I see that most of these resources for crops, or do they contain some florals too? I'm looking for roses and perennials. Yep. So, so Don, what I would say is um, the first step, as always, in pest management is to identify what the pests are. And then the control materials will, uh, the organic materials that are effective against that particular type of pest would be perfectly appropriate. So, um, so for example, the spinosad is a pretty broad spectrum organic control material. Um, it will kill Japanese beetles and some other beetles. It's very effective against caterpillars, but it will also kill pollinators. So if you wanted to spray spinosad on roses or flowering perennials because you had some pest problem on those, uh, you'd probably want to spray it in the evening, right? Uh, if you had caterpillars that were affecting that, then the BT would certainly work. So, uh, and, and any of the trapping things. So, so insect recognition is the first place to start, and then those organic materials would work. Uh, and then the other thing I'd say about florals is check out the horticultural crops section in the ATRA website, and that may give you some specific information as well. To expand uh, on that a little bit, could you comment on people that want a butterfly garden 
And, you know, you don't want him playing with this. You don't want to kill the cat. You want the <laughs> yes. butterflies. Yes, perfect. So if you wanted to kill it, so if you planted a butterfly garden, then killing caterpillars should be the last thing on your mind since caterpillars turn into either butterflies or moths. So um, I think, gosh, that's a, that's a tricky one. If you had a butterfly garden and Japanese beetles were a problem, I think your two choices would be either the hand picking, knocking them into a tub of soapy water, or to spring for that beetle gone BT product that is specific for Japanese beetle adults. That would be, that would be your only two options. Uh, a regular BT product for caterpillars would kill the caterpillars and you're trying to promote butterflies. The spinosad would be effective against caterpillars as well. So that's, that's kind of a tricky one where you're trying to pick and choose who gets to live and who gets to die. And that's one of the advantages of organic controls is that they are more specific. So there is no chemical insecticide you could use that would specifically target only the Japanese beetle adults and let everyone else live. It's going to be a broader spectrum product. So um, uh, there was a question about if there was a handout. I didn't prepare a handout for this simply because I made the PowerPoint presentation available. And the link is there in the chat with all of the resources. The other thing I'll say is I, I put my email address on the, on the title slide of my presentation. So if you've downloaded the presentation, uh, my email address is there and I put it there on purpose. If you have specific organic control questions, uh, certainly the SOS website or uh, an email address that Tom mentioned would be a great place, but feel free to reach out to me and I'll do the best I can to answer your question if I can.